dear friends of the Bayer Foundation. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Bayer Foundation Science Award Ceremony. Today, we are honoring five outstanding scientists who are the winners of this year's prestigious Otto Bayer Award and the Early Excellence in Science Awards. The vision of the Bayer Foundation is to catalyze science and social innovation for a world with health for all and hunger for none. With our programs, we honor outstanding scientists as we do today, support young scientists by fellowships and engage in the dialogue of science and society. We are convinced that societal trust in research and novel technological developments is a key prerequisite to meet today's challenges of climate change and a growing and aging society. But the good news is there are exciting opportunities out there. Next to the digital revolution, which is in everybody's mind, we are in the middle of a biological revolution. <clears throat> Enabled by fundamental discoveries in developmental biology, immunology, microbiome research, or genomics. And it's actually the convergence of these basic discoveries in biology with new technologies, such as advanced imaging, artificial intelligence, new chemistry, or even quantum technologies, which paved the way for a new era in science and an economy which offers the opportunity of connecting innovation with sustainable growth in planetary boundaries. And I am very proud that at the Bayer Foundation, we have a long-standing history of identifying, honoring, and also thereby advancing new groundbreaking research at an early point in time. So let me just mention a few examples. So in 1992, Christiane nussain vollhardt received the Otto Bayer Award for her groundbreaking work in developmental biology. And with this, she was paving the way for a new treatment paradigm of regenerative medicine. Three years later, in 1995, she was awarded with the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. In 2013, Hans-Georg Ramensee received the Bayer Hansen Family Award for his pioneering work in the field of tumor immunology and vaccination. This concept laid the foundation, for example, the company CureVac, which is now collaborating with Bayer to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And in 2015, Emmanuel Charpentier received the Family Hansen Award for her work on CRISPR, a revolutionary gene editing approach. And we were very excited to see that she, together with Jennifer Dutner, received last year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And today, we will honor Professor Ruth Lay, a real pioneer in microbiome research which is a rapidly evolving field in the life sciences. And we will hear more about this in the laudation by Patrick Kramer, who is the chair of the board of trustees of our foundation. And of course, also by Ruth Lay herself afterwards. But science is all about people. And in the Bayer Foundation, we have the pleasure of collaborating with many inspiring leaders in science and innovation. And I'm therefore proud to inform you that we have just published our foundation report for 2020, where you can read about outstanding minds in science and innovation who are willing to take the extra mile. This year's report focuses on women leadership in science and social innovation. So please take some time to read through it and get inspired. And with this, I would like to hand over now to Werner Baumann, the CEO of the Bayer AG, for his keynote. Werner, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> so, thank you, Monica. Dear Ruth Lay, dear winners of the Early Excellence in Science Awards, and uh, uh, dear all uh, on, on this virtual uh, award ceremony. 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. And uh, it's a real pity that uh, we can't meet in person uh, in Berlin. Everything had been prepared by Monica and her team uh, to uh, actually celebrate that very, very special uh, award uh, ceremony uh, in the Futurium in Berlin. Uh, I hope that there's going to be a time where you know we can still meet uh, and then chat uh, and mingle a little bit. Uh, today, you know, we simply have to go with uh, what's possible uh, and use that virtual format that all of us have gotten used to. And I will also say all of us are getting a little bit tired of. Uh, still, it's great uh, to join here. And uh, I think it's the right way to do this as a company that is deeply grounded in science and data. And of course, we know how important the cautionary measures are uh, in the times of the pandemic. Talking about COVID, of course, everything around the virus is on top of our minds these days. And I just want to share a few words on how I think the pandemic is affecting the science community and luckily the perception of science in the broader public. I really don't think that there's ever been a time when literally the whole world watched so intensively and waited so eagerly for scientists to issue their findings as we have experienced this in last year's scientific race against the coronavirus. Um, and um, sure, there have been other pandemics in history, some of them even more severe, but back then the world was a different and very much less connected place. And things also got, went way slower. Yeah, if you look at the Black Death in the Middle Ages, it took 30 years to come from Asia to Europe and COVID managed to go around the world in just about 30 days. Yeah, that's the difference that we see. So in 2020, there were all eyes on science and the value of science for the greater good. And the results are truly phenomenal in record time and much quicker then even the most optimistic observers dared to hope scientists were able to develop various vaccines against the virus. And as of now, at least three vaccines have seen regulatory approval and others, it's actually four by now, and others will hopefully follow soon, including the one that we are working on together with CureVac. This success is also a testament for the global value of, for the value of, of global collaboration. Because in the fight against the pandemic and in the support for researchers, we have seen unprecedented levels of transparency and collaboration between scientists, but also between the public and the private sector. The reaction to COVID was and still is a great moment of science and a source for new and regained public trust in science that is so near and dear to our hearts and so important for progress going forward. As a positive result, we have seen growing attention for science in governments and the media, with several virologists stepping up and being real celebrities by now, and they are regularly informing the public with updates about the pandemic. That's great. I have prior and prior uh, times only see that in Germany with soccer, yeah, so that we have new uh, celebrities that people are now really watching uh, with what they have to tell about the status of the pandemic. Now, in 2021, we are on the brink of a global vaccination program of historic scale. It has the potential to boost trust in science and vice versa, and it needs to get large parts of the population vaccinated. I think we all have to see this as a once in a lifetime opportunity. The more and more people get vaccinated in the course of this year and beyond, the more people will realize that it's the achievement of science that brings hope to the world and ultimately this pandemic to an end. For all of us in the scientific community or in science-based companies, this is of course a challenging time, but it's also very exciting because we are really witnessing one of these breakthrough moments when science finally flanks around, open the door to a new world. And this is not about COVID alone. As you all know, the messaging R messenger RNA is a new mechanism of action based on decades of basic research that now shows promise in several areas. That's just one side of the coin, surely the positive one. And we all should use our voice and our networks to advocate in the described way for the value of science. The other side of the coin, the dark side in this case, is that this progress in record time comes with probably a record amount of conspiracy theories 
and a concerning number of people around the globe questioning the scientific findings against COVID up to the highest levels of government officials. We have seen demonstration against safety measures. We have seen fake news about the virus. We have seen denialism, nationalism and protectionism. Now, the truth is that all of this happens actually simultaneously. Progress and regress, scientific breakthrough and ideological ignorance, information and misinformation. It all happens at the same time. And the question really is, what does it mean? How does the pandemic overall affect trust in science? And how should we deal with misinformation and people denying the facts? Well, I think first, it's important to understand that this is neither unusual for times of change, nor something that was invented by social media or some dark forces in the internet. What we can see is rather a really typical societal pattern in a pandemic. People tend to blame others or are approachable for seemingly simple answers in order to cope with their own uncertainty. This was the experience with other pandemics in history as with other collective upheavals. This is in part human nature. It's also not unusual that new technologies lead to questions and concerns, fears, and sometimes, of course, also setbacks. This is a phenomenon that we have witnessed many times in the history of innovation, and that should actually not deter us. The former US President Barack Obama used to say, progress doesn't always move in a straight line. Sometimes it zigzags, and I think that's exactly right. I'd like to give you one historic example that maybe helps us put things in perspective. As you all probably know, the technology of printing, the invention of books some 500 years ago, played a crucial role in the history of science. The scientific revolution and everything that we call enlightenment, or in German Aufklärung, related to the brilliant minds like Isaac Newton or Immanuel Kant, that wouldn't have been possible without the printing press. But you know what? One of the biggest bestsellers of the time was a book called The Hammer of the Witches. It was a do-it-yourself manual to identify witches. This sold far, far more than anything by Newton, Kant or others. People think about witch hunting as something in the dark middle ages. But the big time for witch hunting was the 16th and the 17th century, exactly the time as the scientific revolution started. The truth is again that both happened at the same time. Actually both was printed by such a breakthrough invention like printing books. From today's perspective, everyone acknowledges the fundamental innovation of book printing for human development. But progress didn't make it in a straight line. There were also these zigzags that I mentioned. I think this is an important lesson for the work of scientists and the engagement with society today. In the short term, academia research us and all of us need to be transparent, explain and discuss the findings, and also the funding of science with the public. And we need to be aware that there might be setbacks, misunderstandings, and actually also intended misinformation. But in the long run, as history has shown, science will prevail. This is true for the pandemic, but it goes far beyond. Because as you know, all know, COVID-19 is not our only challenge. Looking at climate change, the loss of biodiversity, inequality or hunger, there are really are pressing global challenges that we are facing collectively. And the end, in the end, this comes down to the basic question of feeling and feeding a world of up to about 10 billion people in the next decades within our planetary boundaries. Science is the clear, science is clear that overstepping the limits of the planet does increasingly impair health and burden the food supply for the world's growing population, especially in those countries least responsible. And in 2021, it's a reality that many people already suffer from the concrete results or side effects of climate change. So there are unprecedented challenges that must be solved. And I think we all agree that science and innovation must lead the way. Now, the really good news is that help is underway because brilliant minds like the cellular scientists we are honoring today are already dedicating their work and actually their passion to those big questions. 
overall scientific progress we have seen in recent years in labs around the world and the promises of the new tools and technologies are really remarkable. Advances in biology and artificial intelligence, what some experts call the biorevolution, have the potential to transform our economies and contribute to overcoming some of the global challenges I mentioned. In fact, eight of the last 10 Nobel Prizes in Chemistry have been awarded for discoveries in the converging world of genes, cells, and data. The most recent Nobel Prize in 2020 was awarded to Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, as Monica already mentioned, for the discovery of CRISPR-Cas. And on a side note, I don't want to forget to mention that five years prior, as Monica already mentioned, Emmanuel received the Bayer, or the Hansen Award of Bayer, which is besides the Otto Bayer Award, one of the most prestigious awards in scientific excellence. So, uh, Ruth, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but of course, we will also follow your next steps with great interest. So, ladies and gentlemen, I talked about the invasion, invention of book printing hundreds of years ago. And from my point of view, the biorevolution has the potential to become the book printing of our time. In a Nobel lecture in December 2020, Jennifer Doudna talked about the potential of gene editing. She mentioned new therapies and new drug targets diagnostics. She also mentioned nutritious, disease resistant, and climate tolerant crops. And a summary simply was, and I quote here, the possibilities are endless. An essential part of these possibilities is related to our developing understanding of the microbiome, the human microbiome, as well as the microbial communities of our plants, soils, and animals. Research on microbiomes has the potential to revolutionize our approach to nutrition and diseases. And we are very pleased to honor today a, a global leader in microbiome research, particularly with regard to the human biome. Yes. Ruth Lay is a pioneer in the field of microbiome research. To give you an idea, this is the research into all microorganisms that naturally colonize a healthy human and can reach an impressive mass of about one kilo uh, in the human body. Ruth helped to establish this field of research as she was the first person to characterize the important role of the human gut microbiome in obesity. This groundbreaking research opened up new approaches in medical sciences from biomedical research on metabolic disorders to neurology or cancer research. In her career, Ruth also demonstrated that the human's genetic disposition influences the composition of the gut microbiome. And she was also able to show how humans and their microbes have evolved together to develop a win-win symbiotic relation. Dear Ruth, it's great to have you with us and we all are looking forward to learning more about your work in the course of this event. The microbiome is actually also a good example for the huge levers science and innovation could have to tackle climate change and reduce carbon emissions. Researchers are working tirelessly in engineering the soil microbiome so that plants like corn could fixate nitrogen from the air. If successful, we could dramatically reduce the use of nitrogen fertilizer, which generates about 3% of global greenhouse gases today. It would be a huge innovation milestone towards a more sustainable way of agriculture. On the other hand, nitrogen fertilizer itself uses, used to be a huge innovation milestone at the time. Just about 100 years ago, the Haber-Bosch process revolutionized farming by allowing to mass produce fertilizer that fixates nitrogen from the air. Why was that so important? Because at the time, the lack of nitrogen was a pressing global problem in a similar dimension of our current challenges. As the world's population has grown more and more, and as a result, more land was cultivated for grain, the world desperately needed fertilizer and so new sources of nitrogen had to be developed. There was a scientific consensus at the time, and we are talking the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, that without the discovery of new deposits of nitrogen, a massive famine would break out. It was a huge challenge back then, and just like today, it was clear who had to solve the problem. 
You can understand this by looking at a prominent lecture that was given to the science community at that time by Sir William Crookes, one of Britain's most recognized chemists. In 1898, he spoke at an event at the British Association of Science, and he began by clearly stating the problem. He said, the fixation of nitrogen is vital to the progress of civilized humanity. And then he made clear who is able to work on that challenge and who will ultimately deliver the solution. He said, and I quote again, it is the chemist who must come to the rescue of the threatened communities. It is through the laboratory that starvation must ultimately turn into plenty. And ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what happened. With the Haber-Bosch process, chemists invented a way to fix that nitrogen from the air and to produce nitrogen fertilizer. It was an innovation milestone of unmatched extent that saved countless people from starvation. Now, back in our time, the world's brightest minds are working on the next innovation milestones. Again, there are unprecedented challenges. And again, and I'm deeply convinced, it will be the people in the labs who will deliver solutions for all of us. Now, one thing is different compared to all the historic examples of innovation. In our time, we have a much bigger need and an obligation for transparency. There are several studies that have proven the lack of trust in basically all institutions and all people who bear responsibility. By and large, this is true for governments and companies, NGOs and media, and it applies with certain differences for all major countries in the world. The lack of trust questions the foundation of our decision making and our license to operate, especially as the world has to deal with the groundbreaking challenges we already talked about. I'm convinced that mistrust grows in darkness and that we as a business community and scientific community have to set new transparency standards, especially when it's about funding, research and development in areas of systemic relevance, such as health and nutrition. So for a science-based company like Bayer, societal trust is of vital importance. We have strongly increased our efforts for transparency in recent years, but I would like to mention the next step that we are about to take. In a few weeks from now, beginning of April 2021, we will provide transparency on our research collaborations through a publicly accessible register called the Bioscience Collaboration Explorer. It will, date, will be a database in which Bayer will disclose information about new contract-based science collaborations with universities, public institutions, and affiliated individuals. The pilot phase of this initiative will start in Germany and then be stepwise extended to more countries worldwide. The goal of this initiative is clear, generating more transparency about scientific collaborations and thereby increasing trust in what is most important to all of us, and that is trust in science. So, in closing, I would like you to thank you for your attention in this virtual session. I would like to congratulate all scientists that are awarded today, and most prominently, of course, you, Ruth. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your research later on. But also congratulations to our four winners of the Early Excellence in Science Awards that we are honoring now. So with that, thanks to all of you, and let me hand it back to Monica and to Lee. Thanks a lot. So thanks a lot, Werner, and thanks a lot, uh, Monica, for the kind introduction. Unfortunately, um, we had some transmission problems. I think we all experienced this at irregular intervals uh, throughout the pandemic, and it was just another example that even though we've made a lot of progress, unfortunately, the connectivity is not always as good as we would wish. Now, I, I wanted to congratulate Ruth as well from my side. Um, the, the work you're doing is, is phenomenal, hugely important on both human and plant health, and looking very much forward to hearing more about that later. And now it's my incredible honor to uh, award uh, our Early Excellence in Science Awards. Um, uh, Werner spoke a little bit about the fact that some earlier awardees from Bayer had, had received a Nobel Prize um, and was indirectly putting some pressure on Ruth. And uh, for our early excellence in science awardees, you should know that internally we talk about this 
as the future generation Nobel Prize winner program. So not not, not to put any pressure on anybody, but uh, I think it's something that uh, is 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 just a, it's a great recognition. Um, and the early, of course, does not refer to the quality of of the science. Uh, it refers to the stage of your career because what we've seen from from the examples uh, that have been awarded today, it's all absolutely stunning and advanced and, and very excellent science. Now we're going to start first with biology, and and here it's my great honour uh, to start with Dr. Julia uh, Mohammed, uh, who's a researcher at the European Molecular Biology Lab in Heidelberg. So a, a warm congratulations to you, Julia. This is the point in time where you would probably get a standing ovation if, if we were in Berlin. At least you'd get a very loud round of applause. Um, and I think there'd be a lot of very, very proud people in the audience. The, the benefit of this format is we can actually reach a lot more people. So I, I hope your family, your, your faculty, your friends, your colleagues, everyone you know is, is tuning in. And I hope they're as proud of you as we are today. So Julia, it would be great if you could hold up your, your award just to prove that you actually have it. Uh, and, and it would be fantastic if you could tell us a little bit about your work. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, Liam, um, and the Bayer uh, Foundation in general. It's a big honor and importantly, a big vote of confidence in our research. Um, we try to understand basic biology uh, by looking at structures of molecular machines. Um, and very importantly, we do this directly inside cells simply by looking at them. Uh, for this, we develop new technologies in electron microscopy that is done on intact cells in their frozen state. And we can see all these molecular machines, with their interaction partners, um, how they are making RNA from DNA and how they are making proteins uh, inside cells. Very fascinating. Thank, thank you, Julia. Maybe, maybe one very briefly. What excites you most about the work you're, you're doing? Well, this very basic fundamental biology uh, excites me a lot. I think that uh, this is where innovation starts by understanding the basics of life. Um, I'm very excited about the um, the potential to look at uh, these tiny machines and understand how they function. Uh, and I hope that in the future we will continue looking at this and understanding how from little interactions between proteins and nucleic acids um, give rise to uh, whole cells and even whole organisms. Fantastic. Th thanks a lot, Julia. And again, a very warm congratulations to you and looking very much forward to, to following uh, your academic career. So we're going to move on to the next category, which is the chemistry category. And here it's my great honor uh, to award Dr. Joseph Conella from the Max Planck Institute für Kohlenforschung in Mülheim. I guess that's, that, that's carbon research, I guess, uh, uh, Joseph, in, in Mülheim. Um, and you've been working on catalytic, uh, catalytic systems, uh, uh, basically in the space of organic synthesis. And um, so very warm congratulations to you. I mean, the, the topic of organic synthesis is, of course, for a company like Pear, is, is something that's very close and dear to our hearts. But could you maybe tell us a little bit about what's so important about the work you are doing? Hello? Hello. Did you hear me or did your music? Okay, so thank you very much, Liam, and thank you everyone for, for this incredible honor. And I want to extrem you know, extrapolate my, my warmest welcome to all the, to all the uh, 
uh, congratulations, excuse me, to all the uh, awardees. So what we are is, a, is an, an organic chemistry lab that we are looking at, uh, try to try to come up with new technologies and try to assemble organic molecules, uh, which is a still a, a big challenge in the pharma industry, is a big bottleneck still on how we are constructing molecules and um, bringing the, cat the catalysis and all the fundamental chemistry that is behind transition metals or main group elements that enable these technologies is what we are studying here to try to make these this technologies much more practical, more sustainable, and, and at the end, basically, that everyone can use uh, in, a, in, a, in a practical fashion. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and from a, a practical application point of view, where would you see the biggest potential benefits? Well, this is this is as as uh, Monica, I think, at the opening speech said, it's very hard to predict when you study in the basic sciences what is the application or the impact down the road after 25 years. But what we what we what we think is that we what we have to do is to to try to zoom out on the way we are doing molecules currently and try to come up with new disconnections that allow assembly of complex scaffolds much more rapidly and much more efficiently. And I think that is probably one of the ways that that at least the, one of the ways that we're we're looking at it in organic synthesis. Great. Th thanks a lot, Joseph. And maybe Thank you very much. If, if you can just prove that you also got an award, if you yeah. you're all up with <laughs> I did get it, yes. Very great, nice. <laughs> great, great to see. We weren't sure with the virtual postman if yeah. everybody had uh, gotten the award. So again, a warm congratulations, Joseph. And was pointed out earlier uh, from, from uh, Werner and also Monica and the huge importance of, of early research so that later on we do have practical implications. So thanks again for, for that. Yeah, thanks. And we move on to the surge category, and the third category is the medicine uh, category. And here uh, it's my great honor to award Dr. Nikolai Franzmeier from the LMU, LMU Munich, who's working in the space of developing new imaging techniques to investigate Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, of course, this, this is something uh, that we are all aware of. Nikolai is, is a huge societal burden, it's a huge burden on patients, the, the disease of Alzheimer's, but it's also a particular burden on the families of, of patients of Alzheimer's. Uh, and you, you, you're, you're working uh, on, on basically methodologies and, and, and a way um, to not only map Alzheimer's, but predict how it can evolve. And, and through that, I guess, hope, hope to develop or, or lead uh, towards new therapeutics in the future. It would, would be great if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, the breakthroughs that, that you're making through your, your, your work um, and how you think as well from an application point of view, how you think this could be used later on. Nikolai, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, thank you, Liam. Um, thanks to the organizers, to the Bayer Foundation, and to everyone um, for making this possible. And also thanks to my colleagues. Science is never done alone, but by a team of people. And um, as Liam already alluded to, dementia or Alzheimer's diseases can also be seen as a kind of pandemic uh, because we're getting older and older and more and more people will be affected. So we definitely need to work on, on treatment options and in particular our work focuses on to better understand what drives the progression of the disease so what really drives the development of dementia and cognitive decline and to this end we combine multimodal imaging techniques and basically what we're trying to achieve is to come up with prediction models that can can tell where a given patient will move on uh, on the clinical trajectory in the future and uh, these tools can be very powerful in order to um, develop or assess treatment effects or to test whether a treatment is successful or not so we're trying to translate preclinical evidence to in vivo real world imaging data to get a better understanding of of the disease Fantastic. And the focus, Nikolai, on Alzheimer, did that have any particular background or, or was it just the, the, the space that you felt had the, had the highest need or what was the uh, your, your, your specific uh, interest and passion in, in, in diving deeper there? 
Mm, well, from the from starting my studies, I was always very interested in how memory works and uh, how the brain encodes new memories. And of course, Alzheimer's disease is a disease that affects your memory system. So. Um, that's how I ended up uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease research because I was particularly interested in memory and what drives memory decline. Okay. Thanks a lot, Nikolai. And Thank you. A, a warm, warm congratulations and also looking very much forward, uh, same as for our other awardees, looking very much forward to following your career progress and, and also your, your research results. Thank you. Will be very important going forward. And, and our final awardee uh, or award category is the data sciences in life sciences category. Uh, and this is, of course, a very interesting one because it's, it's, it's really when we talk about the, the bio revolution and it's often thought of as connecting the data sciences and advances in, in life sciences, be it biotechnology, chemistry, uh, biology. Um, and, and this intersection is something that our awardee here uh, is, is basically working on. So a very warm congratulations to Dr. Marinka Tsitnik, who is currently at Harvard University uh, in the US. Thanks a lot, Marinka, for joining us today. Um, it would be great if you could tell us a little bit about your work and, and possibly also about how why you ended up in, in the US to further your work. I'm incredibly honored to receive this award today and thank you so much uh, Liam and, and Monica and Patrick and others at Bayer's Foundation for this uh, recognition. Um, my, my research is, is, is focused on designing uh, really large scale algorithms uh, that um, are machine learning algorithms that can sweep through large vasts of biomedical data in order to extract insights extract meaningful patterns and, and actionable hypothesis from downstream experiment for downstream experiment experimentations and i think that's um, an extremely an exciting um, area and uh, that is at the interface of several different disciplines as as you have mentioned including uh, computer science and biology and, and medicine and it's really great to see how these new kinds of uh, technologies new kinds of virtual instruments um, are that are now based on knowledge discovery from data, from data can um, can help us discover and advance uh, scientific questions. So indeed, I'm I'm currently based in the U.S. I think science is really a global endeavor, um, and and for me it was a really an exciting opportunity to go from Europe to, to first to the west coast of the U.S. Uh, to Stanford and then back to the east coast, and who knows where if in a couple of years I might come to Europe again. Um, but it's, it's really a great, great pleasure to be part of a very vibrant scientific community that allows uh, me to collaborate with scientists from a variety of different disciplines. And I hope great. You so in the future. Thanks a lot, Marinka. And, and you told us earlier on that there was no problems with customs and you did get your award as well. <laughs> That's uh, correct. I, I I received my award uh, a, 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 more, um, a few a few days a week ago, and uh, it's it, it it is on my desk, and I, I see it every day. It's a great oh. motivation. <laughs> Super. Thanks a lot. So, again, to to all four of you, um, a a really warm congratulations. Uh, and I hope a lot of people, as it was said earlier, um, science is a team sport. Of course, you have a lot of fantastic colleagues that, that you're all working with. So I guess you, you can share this award uh, with, with them as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's your also individual recognition that we want to uh, recognize here. Um, so huge congratulations and looking forward again to, to following your progress in the future. And with that, we will close the Early Excellence in Science Award Ceremony and move on to the Otto Bayer Award Ceremony. And with that, I'll hand back to Werner. I would uh, then just briefly open the ceremony and uh, 
we have a short uh, introductory uh, video which we want to show now. So maybe we can start this now. Yeah. My name is Ruth Lay. I am the director of the Department of Microbiome Science at the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Tübingen. We work on the human gut microbiota, how they've co-evolved with us, and how these microbes that inhabit our intestines influence our metabolism and our health. I was lucky as a young researcher to be part of the first group of people that investigated how the composition and diversity of the human gut microbiome affected health. And we did this in the context of obesity. And since then, uh, we in my own group have been looking into mechanisms underlying how the microbiome can influence our metabolism. And we've also been delving into the co-evolution of microbes with the human host over time and how this also affects our health. My background in microbiology is environmental microbiology, and as a postdoctoral researcher, I made the switch over to medical sciences, which was unusual at the time for environmental microbiologists, and my colleagues actually thought that it was sad that I'd be working with mice, but actually it turned out to be a really um, good career move for me, and uh, it opened up a whole lot of really exciting science. So from the personal side, I met my husband at work. He's also a scientist. And so we've had to pursue these parallel careers over time, looking for jobs in the same places, looking for opportunities that work for both of us. And we've been very, very lucky with that. He's now a Humboldt professor here in Germany at the University of Tübingen. And um, it's, it's been challenging, but also very rewarding um, that, that we're both scientists because I think we understand and complement each other very well. So I think it's, it's important for young researchers to, to not second guess what they'd like to do and to, to follow their interests wherever that might be. Um, you can never really anticipate what it's going to be like working in one place or another. And um, you can find very different opportunities in different places. And so don't be afraid to move and find the place that's right and uh, really follow your heart and follow your interests. I think it's important to take the time to think. I think it's important to, to go on long walks or long bicycle rides and, and just let the mind wander. Um, also take time to, to read, take time to read outside of one's work area and take the time to talk to people and take the time to really listen to people, especially the people we work with. And with this, I would like to ask Patrick Kramer to give the dotation. Please, Patrick. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Monica. It's um, really a great pleasure to introduce to you this year's uh, Bayer Award winner, Ruth Lay. We heard a little bit about her in the video, but let me maybe dig a little bit deeper. And um, let's start with this initial observation. It really may sound strange to many of you that we are not alone in our bodies. But really from the day we are born, we collect bacteria and other microorganisms that now live within us. And you can imagine it was a sensation when such microbes were first observed. At the end of the 17th century, the Dutch Anthony van Leeuwenhoek put a drop of his saliva under a little self-made microscope and he was very excited and wrote a letter to the Royal Society that he thinks that actually little animals, as he called these microbes at the time, would live inside of his mouth. But today we know that trillions of microbes inhabit our body. They constitute the so-called microbiome, which influences our health in many different ways. So the microbiome in our guts, for example, has impacts on diseases such as cancer, obesity, we heard about it, but also autoimmune disorders. And it even uh, alters the way that we respond in an individual manner to various drugs. 
Bruce Lay, our award winner today, is really a pioneer in this exciting field. And the field really only took off uh, with the advent of next generation sequencing 10, 20 years ago. Now researchers can actually detect a large variety of microorganisms. Microbial communities were now analyzed in very complex samples and even on a population scale. This revealed that the microbiome differs from one person to another, or as Ruth Lay has put it, one person's healthy microbiome might not be healthy in another context. A key finding of Ruth Lay was her initial demonstration that the microbiome influences metabolism. So for example, the microbiome changed when humans started to drink cow milk about 10,000, 8,000 years ago. Microbes can evolve so much faster than we as humans can, and thus they could help us to respond more quickly to changes in our lifestyle. And this happened before the evolution of what we call lactose tolerance, which now also helps us to digest milk. The microbiome apparently also helped us to respond to different things, for example, local pathogens, such as the malaria parasite. How did Ruth get into all of this? Well, she was working with Jeff Gordon at Seattle, and she found in 2004 a connection between the microbiome and obesity. And in her key experiment, she transferred intestinal bacteria into mice that were living in a sterile environment, and therefore these mice would lack a microbiome. What was really interesting in this experiment, these mice now gained weight, and they gained even more weight when bacteria from heavy mice were used. And believe it or not, a similar connection between the microbiome and body weight seems to exist in humans as well because Ruth could demonstrate that the intestinal microbiome differs in overweight people when you compare them to normal weight people. Later on during her time as a faculty member at Cornell University, Ruth Lay showed how the gut microbiome supports, uh, supports fertility and reproduction. Her lab also characterized the microbiome of a total of 416 twin pairs. And very surprisingly, this showed evidence that some microbes in the intestinal flora of these twins uh, appear to be inheritable. A few words about Ruth. She's really a cosmopolitan. She grew up in England, France, California. She graduated from Berkeley, and this was in the early 90s. Then she received her PhD in 2001 from the University of Colorado, and she became an assistant professor at Cornell in 2008 and moved on to associate professor in 2013. And since 2016, she has been director at the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Tübingen. Um, you should know that Ruth is actually familiar not only with microbes that live inside our bodies, but with microbes around the world. Just to give you a few ideas, she worked in national parks in Hawaii. She showed that soil bacteria in the Rocky Mountains were active even in winter, and she studied salt bacteria in Mexico. So in addition to that, Ruth is a passionate cyclist and she also, you probably don't know this, um, models very large clay sculptures. She actually has a ceramic studio at her house and this is run uh, like the whole house with solar power. So to sum up, Ruth Lay has been pushing the frontier in microbiome research. Her laboratory continues to be at the forefront by combining experiments with data science, bioinformatics, and also trying to move more and more from correlations to causality. Ruth also shapes the scientific community. She gives a lot of talks and, for example, she's a speaker at the Tübingen Cluster of Excellence that is called 
controlling microbes to fight infections. So she's really up to date, provided that we now live through, you know, a huge pandemic. Where will the future lead, Ruth? She outlined this path for herself, saying that the aim should be to include in medical diagnostics and treatment environmental influences that patients have been exposed to, such as nutrition and other factors, which all together shape the microbiome. There's still some way to go before her vision, vision will be turned into clinical routine, but I'm sure that today's Bayer Award can be an encouragement to stay on this very promising path for the future. Dear Ruth, we all wish you best of success and we congratulate you very much for receiving the Otto Bayer Award today. Many congratulations. Thank you, Patrick, for that really amazing laudosio. And, and, and I'd like to thank Werner and Monica and the Board of Trustees and the Bayer Foundation um, for, this, for this really amazing award. I was, um, I was very moved to receive this and, and honored and humbled by it. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that. And also, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity today um, to take a little bit of time to tell you about our research and to tell you about the microbiome. Um, I've, there's a picture here of the microbiome on the wall. You can see in false color these, uh, these little microbes. And this is what I'll refer to as the microbiome, an assemblage of microbes, uh, bacteria, archaea, um, these particular ones um, in someone's gut. Uh -huh. ah. Okay. Um, before I before I launch into some of the work um, that Patrick has already explained to you, actually quite nicely, um, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to recognize the young people who really are the engines of science. Um, science is done by young people. They join us often directly out of university. Um, they come to us excited, uh, smart, curious, unbiased. And here's just some pictures of some of the people I've had the, the honor and the opportunity to work with over the years in, in various configurations. Um, up here on the uh, right, most, uh, most recently here at the Max Planck. And so this is really uh, for them as well and, and, and does recognize the, the, that it is a team effort and the tremendous um, contribution of young people to basic science in general. So when you, when you think about the, the natural world that we inhabit, um, you might think something like this, landscapes, um, trees, plants, some animals, a waterway. Um, when, when, when a microbiologist thinks about the, uh, the natural world, what we really think of is what a tremendous, what a tremendous uh, opportunity, a number of opportunities for microbes to live on all of these fantastic surfaces. So for instance, in soil, we have a, an enormous reservoir of, of microbes in soil. Many of them also associate with plant roots. And as Werner mentioned, um, these can also take atmospheric nitrogen and split it and make nitrogen um, available to plants and nutrition. So they, they drive biogeochemical bio cycling of nutrients. Um, there's microbes in all of the waterways. They, they photosynthesize. They're also in your tap water, but don't worry about it. They've been there the whole time. Even if you didn't know, it's not a problem. Um, there's microbes in the air. So, so we've heard a lot about uh, viruses uh, and transmission of viral particles, but we also have bacteria in the air. And these, for instance, seed the clouds and allow rain. Um, so, so really, there's microbes on every single surface, and there's really a lot inside the guts of animals. Um, it's an extremely rare animal that doesn't have a teeming microbiome that helps it digest food and educate the immune system and protect against uh, 
chemicals and, all, and, and these kinds of things. But there's one place, there's one very special place where microbes are excluded. And, and this is really, really very unusual. And that is the womb. So this is a, a really remarkable space. By microbial standards, it's huge. And when we develop into fetuses and then to babies inside the womb, we are in a, in a germ-free space. So all the, the mother's body is designed to keep microbes away from the, from the developing fetus. But then once the baby's born, of course, um, here you now have a very large organism that is completely germ-free that arrives in the world and, and is rapidly colonized. And where do these microbes come from? Well, they come from everyone around. So they come primarily from who, the caretakers, the mother, from the family members, from the community. We all contribute microbes to the, to the newborn babies. There might even be a few from the dog. Um, and then, of course, the baby is exposed to other microbes and other surfaces, such as uh, from food or from playing in the dirt. And these microbes might pass through the baby, but they're not going to take hold because the human microbiome is really adapted to humans and we get it from other humans. And it's very much influenced by the people that we grow up around. And so we know now um, that the diversity and the complexity and the sheer mass of microbes in the gut increases over time as we get older. And by the time we're adults, we end up with something on the order of 10 to 100 trillion microbial cells that we carry with us. And these are influenced at first by the community of people that were there when we first um, grew up in the world. And then that's the composition of these is shaped by other factors such as how we live our lives, our health, what we eat, um, our health state. And so what, we've, what we know now from looking at many people is that each one of us as an adult has a fairly stable microbiome that's individualized. We each have our very own microbiome. There's similarities between people and there's differences between people. And it's these similarities and differences and how they relate to health um, that, that's, that's been the focus of, of some of our work and others. So just a, a comment on how we do this. Um, we'll take at this point thousands of people who will give us uh, some sample like a stool sample. In each one of these, there's billions of microbes. The microbes all have DNA. Um, we'll extract DNA from the whole tube, and so we'll end up with thousands, uh, thousands, uh, an inordinate number of small uh, pieces of DNA that then are sequenced um, thanks to these uh, next generation sequencers um, that were developed for the Human Microbiome Project, but have been uh, very handy for microbiome research as well because we can generate an inordinate amount of DNA sequence data which then uh, we use in, the, in a gigantic bioinformatics puzzle to reconstruct the genomes of these microbes that all the pieces came from. And so what we can end up with at the end is um, for thousands of individuals, you can imagine thousands of rows across hundred, hundreds or even into the thousands of different species, we can see the proportion of different microbes across different individuals. And it's this kind of data that we can then use to formulate hypotheses about why certain microbes are, are more abundant in certain types of people according to their lifestyles and so on. So as, as Patrick had mentioned, um, I first got involved in this kind of research with, with Jeff Gordon. And there we made the observation that the, the, the microbiomes of people with a high BMI classified as obese differed from those uh, with a normal BMI classified as, as normal weight. And that led us to ask the question, um, oops, that led us to ask the question, um, is this a manifestation of, of this disease state or the, 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 the physiology of the people? Um, or is there a feedback loop where these microbes are actually somehow contributing to the disease state? Now, it isn't actually possible to take a person and remove their microbes and replace them with other microbes. Uh, microbes uh, hang on. You can't just get rid of them with antibiotics. 
Um, so what you need in order to test out different microbiomes um, is, is uh, an experimental system. And, and this has been developed um, over the decades, starting in the early part of the 20th century. Um, scientists figured out that they could actually take young animals from the womb and put them directly into a sterile isolator and they could grow up in there. So here's a, an example of a germ-free mouse and um, it's living inside a sterile isolator. So all of its air is filtered, food and water are, um, are sterilized. And so what we can do is then take this mouse and give it a microbiome and look to see what happens to it. So we can take a we can give it a microbiome of a lean donor, or we can give it the microbiome of an obese donor. And what happens is, when given a lean donor microbiome, we'll have a lean mouse, and when given an obese donor microbiome, we'll end up with a mouse with greater adiposity, greater body fat. Um, in, in my own group later, uh, we, we started looking at pregnant women. And uh, here we're looking at the gut microbes of the pregnant women. So again, the womb is sterile, but the mothers have gut microbes. And, and what was striking to us is that they resembled um, obese subject microbiomes. So this was very odd to us. And we wondered what was happening here. And what, what we found really is that um, the obese microbiome uh, can alter the metabolism of the host in such a way that there's elevated blood sugar or increased fat storage. And this is not necessarily desirable when you're not pregnant, but when you are pregnant, higher blood sugar can help support the growth of the baby and higher body fat can help um, set up the mother for success in breastfeeding later on, which is very energetically uh, demanding. So, so the same microbiome that's having a, a metabolic inflammation effect can actually be positive in one context and not so positive in another context. And this is where uh, location, 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 uh, it's true for real estate and it's true for the microbiome. When your uncle from America calls you up and tells you I've got a Victorian house for you, um, it behooves you to ask where it is because in one case it might be a problem in another a bonanza. And so for the microbiome, it really does, it's not just what kind of microbiome it is, but where it is as well. So uh, there's been uh, in the last 10, 15 years, um, more and more research uh, into what shapes the microbiome or in terms of lifestyle, diet, disease, different disease contexts and so on. My group started thinking about human genetics and the genetic makeup of the host and how this might influence microbiome composition as well. And we did find that knowing um, the, the genotype of the individuals could help us explain some of the variants in the microbiome. In other words, there is a genetic predisposition that people have for certain kinds of microbiome compositions. And in particular, I'm going to mention this family of bacteria called the Crisincinlaceae. And these were, were very much under influence of host genotype. So some people had a lot of them, and some people had few of them, and, and this was due to host genetic influences, all else being equal. But then what we didn't expect to see was that we also saw more of these bacteria in the lean people and fewer in the obese people. And so what we might have here is a genotype effect on host physiology that's acting through the effect on microbes. So we wanted to test how these, these gut bacteria affected the host as well. Um, I should say that this family of bacteria, since we reported this association, has been shown uh, to be associated with a low BMI or with a healthy metabolic state uh, across the world. So he here we have a map showing studies since 2014 when we first reported this um, of, of studies um, in North America, South America, Europe, the Middle East, uh, China, Japan, Korea. Uh, the size of the dots tells you how many people are in, this, are in the study. So, you know, 5,000 people in some of these studies. Um, and again and again, we're seeing this association between these bacteria and a, and a healthy metabolic state. 
So can we, can we uh, recapitulate this um, experimentally? We can take our germ-free animals and we can give them an obese person's microbiome. And again, we get um, a fatter mouse. What if we add these Christian CHA bacteria that are associated with leanness? Well, we do get a leaner mouse. So adding these to, to this microbiome that usually causes a fatter mouse um, rescues that and you, you end up with a leaner mouse. So you can imagine that the family Christensiaceae of bacteria is of great interest to us. It's one of our most, uh, it's our, one of the ones um, that we like the most in the pantheon of microbes at the moment. And we're trying to understand how it works. Um, how does it work with other microbes in the gut? And who are its co-conspirators? So for instance, we know that it is very good at cross-feeding hydrogen and carbon dioxide to methanogenic archaea, which are, which are uh, microbes in the gut that make methane, for instance. And so we're, we're starting to, to put together how it works with other microbes to affect the metabolic output of the microbiome and how that may then influence host, host metabolism. So there's many others um, in this very large and dynamic field now, um, looking at all kinds of questions. For instance, how the gut microbiome might influence malnutrition and, and difficulty in recovery from malnutrition, um, how it could influence uh, brain activity or, or diseases such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and the gut brain axis here, or how it can um, interact with, with cancer treating drugs such as checkpoint inhibitors and certain types of cancers. Um, it's a very dynamic field with a lot of going on at the moment. Um, in my lab, we're particularly interested in taking, as Patrick mentioned, uh, an evolutionary angle to these questions. How did our microbiomes um, through our evolution and when we spread around the world into new environments, help us adapt to new environments. But now that we've very quickly, since the Industrial Revolution, radically changed our lifestyle and environment, how are these microbes that, that helped very much under sun conditions maybe uh, be helping less now? And um, what can we do in order to perhaps reshape our microbiomes to uh, to be better suited to our modern lifestyle and can we use them and in what contexts for promoting health. So I'm sorry I didn't talk about plants, <laughs> but um, you can do all of this with plants too. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, to, to point you to, to our website if you're interested in the technical details, which I glossed over. Um, you can read our papers here. You can find us through the Max Planck Society, and I'd like to thank them for further supporting our work. And thank you very much again for this award. And I'd also like to congratulate Julia, Joseph, Nikolai, and Marinka for their awards, uh, because they are the future, and I look forward to their Nobel Prizes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruth. It was a really exciting journey in the world of microbes. And also uh, one congratulations from my side uh, for the award and also uh, to the four Early Excellence in Science Award winners. So with this, uh, we come to the end of this award ceremony, which has been a very special one. But uh, I think you could all see it comes from the heart. And uh, we wish you all the best for the future and looking forward to stay connected and wish you a lot of success. Um, for your work. So with this, I would like to end this year's ceremony and thank everyone for joining us today.